And whether you are pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, this event takes place at the end of that tribulation, even after the rapture of the church, is what we're discussing today in Revelation 19. So we're not going to talk too much about the rapture of the church. We're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. And this leads into the great white throne judgment that comes up in chapter 20. I, I wish if we were going to do this, we could go through and study Revelation all the way through. Um, because it's such uh, an interesting book. But I've always said, and I'll continue to say it as long as I minister the gospel of Christ. I don't care where you are eschatology-wise. I don't care what your view of the rapture and the second coming are. If you're not living Ephesians and James and the gospel, it's not going to matter. Because we are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And that's my primary purpose. My primary purpose in teaching is not to fill people's minds with, with the information. It's great to have information. It's great to have that knowledge. But the Bible says knowledge puffs up. Right. What do you do with that knowledge? That's where learning comes in. That's where wisdom comes in. What do you do with what you learn? Does it change your thinking? Does it change the way you live in front of your lost friends? Because if it doesn't, then it's not doing any good. We have to remember this earth is only a pilgrimage. We belong to a king and a kingdom that is not of this world. And we're, that's what, kind of what we're going to focus on today so that we get the mindset of the kingdom. Jesus said over and over again, and he's the one we're to emulate or to, and the one we're to uh, live like and become like. He said, I am not of this world. I come from my Father, and what the Father asks me to do and gives me the directive to do, that's what I do. And I'm paraphrasing there, but what he was saying was, regardless of what I see, Regardless of what I think about what I see as a human, I'm still only going to do what my father says I should do. And as believers, that's the way we're supposed to be. Now, it's not as easy because we have so many distractions in our world today. Amen? Mm -hmm. Regardless of what those distractions are, whether they're good or bad or indifferent, is irrelevant, they're there. So... Let's dive in and let's look at Christ's triumphant return, starting in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. And I'll read those two, and then we'll go from there as y'all begin to look that up. Uh, Revelation 19, 13, the Bible says, And I saw heaven open. This is John, remember, on the Isle of Patmos, and he's seen a huge vision. And, and let me go back and make a statement, a declaration. Revelation is singular it is not plural it is not revelations like so many people pronounce it they add an s it is revelation it is singular it is one of it that is expounded upon through 22 chapters it happened at one event on the Isle of Patmos it wasn't John had days of visions he had one day one vision and he wrote it down as he was laid out before the Lord. And then, and then he wrote it down. And so we need to remember that. Because what we think about what happened. Helps us understand what was written. When you read Revelation. You should read it all the way through in one setting. Because it is a continual story. There are no chapter breaks in the original. It was one story written from Re Revelation 1.1 1 -1 to Revelation 22. Whatever the last verse is. In one setting, with no breaks, no punctuation, and that's the way it should be read. Because it gives us a better 
and a more clear understanding of what John was saying to the church. So let's read it. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but only him. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, let me tell you something. Those two verses, three verses right there, have a dissertation of theology that we could discuss and talk about on those three verses probably for three to six months in this class. Uh, there's just that much there. We're going to talk about it because we need to understand John describes the writer as faithful and true. And we know that the term faithful and true is an Old Testament theme of God. When we read in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, and Isaiah 49, 7, we learn that this term, faithful and true, represents God. So when John is saying he is sitting on the horse, the writer is faithful and true. He's acknowledging who Jesus is. He is God. He, did, he also mentions this back in verse chapter 3, verse 14. Um, at the amen, faithful and true witness. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago on the church at Laodicea. He called him the faithful and true witness. And so we understand that this Old Testament term is brought on here by John in Revelation 3 and Revelation 19 to show we sometimes look at Jesus and his humanity, and we need to, but we sometimes forget his deity. He is the sovereign God. He is faithful and true. And we need to remember that. And that's what John is doing when he sees this vision and this horse. He's saying this writer, Christ, he is God. And, and, and he brings us together at the end of this verse, which we're going to get to, uh, this end of this chapter, which we're going to get to one way or the other. We're not going to go into church service, trust me. <laughs> I might have to speed up a little bit or skip over some stuff. Um, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Um, you know, that, that phrase there, his eyes were as a flame of fire, uh, that's also mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 14 of Revelation. Both passages are describing Jesus, and the description probably has to do with his ability to see everything and have it laid bare before him. Now, I need you to get that picture. See, Jesus doesn't all of a sudden get eyes as flaming fire. He has eyes as a flaming fire. And everything we do individually and corporate are laid bare before him. Everything we say, everything we are, everything we do, he already knows and sees it. So often, we as humans think that I can do a little something and it won't be noticed. Anybody ever think that way? Nobody will see me? Kind of reminds me of my grandma. Yeah? She could look at me, <laughs> oh, but yeah. look through me. <laughs> yes. And she would know things before I ever got home. <laughs> yes, I, I had a mother like that. <laughs> 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 Oh, this creature with the eyes all around, you know? Yeah. I mean, mom. Right, right, right. <laughs> and and you, you know that head. look. You know that look. When that look happens, like it's all over. Well, <laughs> it, it is true. It is true. Jesus sees everything, and it's laid before him. But I want you to notice something, and I love this. 
And this is what we need to learn about this. Jesus is not laying you bare so he can persecute you or judge you. Their eyes as a fire. Fire purifies. Jesus' eyes is looking it on you so that when you mess up, he can show you and purify you. <laughs> yeah, it's, he, see, we got this mentality sometimes in the church that Jesus is watching me to slap me down, to, to call me. No, it's to purify me and to refine me. It's to make me better. It's not to judge. There is going to be a judgment. But this is just to purify us and make us more like Christ. What a thought. The vesture dipped in blood. Oh, I like this. You know, you're sitting here and you're reading through this and you see this phrase in this passage that here is John describing this rider on the horse and this robe he has is dipped in blood. Now, if it's dipped in blood, that means blood's probably dripping from it, and and, and that would be gory, and, and some people would even cringe and, and possibly even get sick to their stomach at the sight of blood. And some scholars believe that um, it is either the blood of his enemies or his blood from his sacrifice. I like to believe that it is the blood of his sacrifice. I do. Now, one of the reasons is because his enemies are still alive, which we'll learn in just a few minutes later. The enemies are not yet um, dead yet, and what an eternal rem remembrance of what Jesus did for me. If I'm in his army to come back with the with the second coming, not the rapture, but the second coming, and I see the blood that allowed me to be there. I saw the price for me to be in that army. What would it do to your life? And what would it do to my life if we saw that robe every day? What, the blood? Yes. Well, you pass over us. I get it, but I'm saying that if we individually and corporately, when we're together, understand what really took place at that sacrifice, I think we take it for granted far too often. I agree with that. It should be instilled in our mind constantly. Exactly. It, it should be instilled in our mind constantly. The pro We talk about it. We understand the verbiage. But do we really internally in our spirit understand and in our thought, in our daily lives understand the penalty that was paid for us, the debt that was paid for us? And I think this is an eternal reminder what he did for me. <sighs> Nothing but the blood. There's power in the blood. Huh. Sing it. I can't sing it. Well, you don't want really to sing it. No folks on Facebook Live would leave as fast as they got on. <laughs> Isaiah 63, 1 through 3, 63, 1 through 3 seems to lead toward it being his enemies. Somebody read Isaiah 63, 1 through 3. One, two, three. Uh -huh. Who is this who comes from Edom? Is that it? Uh -huh. With dyed garments from Bozar, this one who is glorious in his apparel, fabric in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. <coughs> Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the people no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. The blood is sprinkled upon my garment, 
and I have stained all my robes. Okay, so he said he has a blood sprinkled upon his vesture there, and he's treading down his enemies like someone treads grapes in a wine press. Now, I don't know how many people know about a wine press. In the days of Christ, a wine press was a certain area that they had cleaned out, and they would build a wall up around it out of clay and uh, different stuff, thatch, if you want to use that term, or make kind of bricks and, and heat it and build a wall. And most of the ones I've seen were somewhere between three and four foot tall. And if you read back at, at uh, Gideon, that's where he was, was in the threshing, he was threshing wheat in the wine press because he could hide behind the wall. And it was three or four, and people would go into that wine press and they would step on the grapes. And the grape juice would get everywhere. And what he's saying is in this passage in Isaiah is that this person who was represented of Christ was stepping on his enemies with his wrath and their blood was going everywhere. And, and I know this is kind of gory. And he was sprinkling blood on his garments. I do not think you can tie that story with Revelation because they're two different events. Personally. And so I believe the blood on the vesture, dipped in blood. The blood doesn't sprinkle on it, it is dipped in blood. What blood is in heaven? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus' blood. When he went in a, to heaven after the resurrection, the blood had to be accepted by the Father to be an acceptable sacrifice. Like the high priest would go in with the blood of the Lamb and sprinkle it on the most holy place in the holy of holies on the mercy seat and on the altar and it was accepted and so the only blood in heaven is the blood of Christ so if his vesture was dipped in blood it would have been his well in this in my Bible here it gives a description of it, it said Christ's robe is dipped in his atoning blood Yes. Not that of his enemies, since the battle has not yet taken place. That's what I said. Yeah. yeah. But there are some scholars that believe the latter, and I tend not to, um, based on that. It's his atoning blood, because that's the only blood in heaven. Even his enemy bloods are not going to be in heaven. He comes down here. So anyway, my point is this, in that, is the fact that we need a memory jar of this vision on a regular basis of the atoning blood of Christ because anything we are and anything we hope to be and anything we can be as believers is only through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. My good works means zilch to the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. My good works, anything I do, any way I live, means zilch to the kingdom of God. I am the righteousness of God through Christ. And only through Christ. And because of that, I live a life that's different than my former life. I don't live a life to please God. I live a life because I'm pleased with God. With what he did on my behalf. I don't do it to gain favor. I do it because I have favor. That's good. <laughs> I don't do it so, so to be blessed. I do it because I am blessed. <laughs> Ephesians 1, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I could preach right there for a long time. Anyway, then we go to verse 14. Somebody read that for me. We're talking about the great army. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Clothed in white linen and clean. Wow. Great army that follows him, the white horse, his horses, their horses are white just like his, showing purity and unity.
Now, if we are the representative of Christ on earth, like we're going to be in heaven, we need to have purity and unity. Let me ask you a, a question because I thought about this as I was studying this lesson. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that everybody in heaven is going to believe just like you believe here on earth? No. It's well, just I, one mind. Yeah, one mind we're, we're going to be more. worshiping him. I don't know that our opinions are really going to make any difference then. But why, then why do they matter here? We haven't been redeemed yet. <laughs> oh, we have been redeemed. I mean, uh, raptured. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The day I gave my life to Christ, I became a kingdom child and a and, and, and a um, um, an inhabitant of the kingdom. I don't wait to go to heaven to get what I have. I got it the day I went to the cross by faith in what Jesus had already accomplished. So why can't we put our petty differences aside here on earth like it's going to be done in heaven? Because the Bible says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, I know, that's tough. We like our fleshly mindset and we like to be different from those that are different from us and we want to separate our differences. Why don't we celebrate our likenesses? Why don't we celebrate our unities? We're kingdom people. We're not earthly people. I know that's tough. It goes against everything we've been ingrained since we were born. But we've been reborn. And we're not of this world. Just because I live on earth doesn't mean I have to live earthly. Sensual. Set apart. Huh? It should be set apart. Whether we agree or not. Right. What goes on on this earth. <clears throat> anyway, enough said. I could preach there for a long time. <laughs> Purity and unity. Think about that. Every day. Think about the blood. The atoning sacrifice. And then think about the purity and the unity. Because it needs to go from heaven to earth. In our daily lives. Clothed in white clean clothes. I love it. It's also mentioned in Revelation 3, 4. But you have a few people in Sardis. Who have not soiled their garments. And they walk with me in white. For they are worthy. It is odd that the leader Christ is prepared for battle. And yet his army is already clean and pure. That ought to make somebody jump up and run about seven laps. <laughs> what does he mean? They are white because of the blood of his vesture. And they are not going to battle. They're only going to witness him win the battle. Mm -hmm. That's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. That is going to be awesome. But why isn't it awesome now since we're already under the blood? We're already white. We're already spotless. We're already righteous and pure and holy and sanctified and being sanctified for the kingdom. Now, why do we need to wait till then to let him fight our battles? Mm, that's good. <laughs> See, we always put this revelation in a future mindset. And it, it is a future mindset. But let's make it applicable to my life today. They are white because of the blood on his vesture, the atoning sacrificial blood, and they are not going to battle, only witness him win the battle that had already been accomplished on the cross. See, the battle has already been won. Right. Paul says in one of his epistles, and I don't know the address, but he says he nailed them to the cross, making an open shame, defeating them. 
I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. But it was simply saying when he died on the cross, it was an open gesture of his defeat of all the forces of this earth and the enemy. Jesus is not going to win the war. Jesus has already won the war. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good question what you asked. Mm -hmm. And that is, why don't we do it today? Well, I can only go by what I think, which is muddled. But years ago, when I was a little boy, my grandma would drag me to church. I, I saw things that I haven't seen since take place in the church. Right. And I asked myself years ago, why in the world did all these things, no time on church? I mean, if it ended at midnight, you know, it ended at midnight. Uh, you know, people coming to God and being yeah. slain in the spirit and all. Why do we not see that today? Well, distraction is the only thing that I figured out that could stop that. Things that takes our mind from where it ought to be and puts it in places where it shouldn't be. Well, back then we didn't have television and all that mess and people didn't have more time to worship and read the Word of God and they don't do it today. They put TV in front of everything that they stand for. Well, not just TV, but no. other okay. But here's the thing. I, I, I get it. There are many distractions. and and But there were distractions in, too. I mean, there was TV in some of those movements. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had TV when the Brownsville Revival broke out. Well, I'm going back way before not that. Too I, I've got you, but I mean, let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk. I mean, even way before then, when, when the church, you know, uh, you, you think about Adele Moody, who had one of the largest prayer groups in the world. They would meet for prayer during the Depression and pass out food and pray from 12 to 1, and revival broke out. What about Azusa Street? Azusa Street, you know, that was a movement, and, and we need to be a heritage of that. <clears throat> The only way, and I'm going to say this with caution, but the only way God is going to move in the church is when God moves in our hearts individually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to carry revival with us. Billy Graham once said, and I really love it, that we can have any revival anytime we want to. Right. We just got to meet the qualifications. Mm -hmm. That is a seeking heart, a purified heart, a hungry heart, and I forget all of them because it's been years since I read the quote. But, but he was saying we can live in a state of revival. We can live in a state of that because it's already paid for. I don't need to conjure up a revival. Then it wouldn't be a revival. That's right. It doesn't need. It, it, we love revivals and we need revivals. Mm -hmm. We definitely need reviving. Revival means to revive a so slowly dying flame. To rekindle a slowly dying flame. Yes, we need revival. Mm -hmm. But why can't we walk ablaze every day? Mm -hmm. Like Paul did. We have to decide for ourselves if we're going to walk in revival. Yes. We can't decide for everybody else. Yes. Everybody's too busy. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We have to decide for ourselves that we're going to burn every day. It begins with us. It begins right. with me. And whether people get contagious or not, I heard a story years ago, and it, it just really kind of eliminates this because i got to move. i got to get through this chapter because there's so much here. But there was a missionary that went overseas and went to this uh, ingenious tribe, however you pronounce it, and he stayed there for 20 years. He had one convert in 20 years. One. Every day he went to the marketplace. He preached every week in his little tent. Where was it? I don't remember. It's been a long time since I heard the story. It was when I was in, in Bible college 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, when he died uh, and then sent back to the States and buried, there was a young man that went to replace him as a missionary. And the first week, the church was full. 
And the whole village got saved. And they said that man stayed here for 20 years faithful to this community. I want to serve the God that he told us about. That he lived. The man was revival and had no one there with him. <laughs> day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, and year in and year out for 20 years. Why? Because he knew the master and nothing else mattered. Nobody else mattered. He wasn't there for success or results. He was there to honor God and that alone. And when we get that mindset, we'll walk in revival. We'll live in revival. Yeah, we'll have bad days. I'm sure he had many bad days. And I know a lot of people wouldn't have stayed for the 20 years. But he did. All right, so Jesus fights our battles. If we are under his blood, we are pure, righteous, victorious, and perfect. Not going to be, we are. Today. What does it mean to be a part of the Lamb's army today? That's a good question. Well, I want you to think, I don't want you to answer. I want you to think about this in your individual life. What does it mean for you to be a part of the Lord's army today? in your day in and day out life. And secondly, what does it look like to make Christ the Lord of your life? You see, I'm afraid the last one we have missed. We have thought that making him the Lord of our life means I do certain things and live a certain way. No, Letting him be the Lord of the life means he lives through me. He sits on the throne. I don't make the decisions. Well, he describes a relationship that he wants with us. And if we can hold a mirror up to ourselves, having a military background, I can tell you that if I charged into Vietnam in a battle, and I turned around and I see I'm charging by myself, that's gonna cause me to uh, have some thoughts. Right. So if we are all part of that same army, we're all gonna be shoulder to shoulder. We're yep. all gonna be one and the same. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, we're gonna look around and see us standing there by ourselves. And I'm afraid because of some of our earthly mindset that we talked about earlier, that's what we're seeing in many of Christians. Boy, don't get me started. So, all right, let's talk about the name. King of Kings and Lord of Lords, verses 15 and 16. Somebody read it. We've got 15 minutes. I've got to fly. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that was with it. He should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of his fierceness, fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his side a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right. <clears throat> In this passage, verses 15 and 16, John uses both biblical and historical language in this description. All of his first century readers would have known what John was saying. The language challenges the powers of the earth and shows that Jesus is the hope of God's people. Both Daniel 2.47 and 1 Timothy 6.15 use the term King of Kings and Lord of Lords in one variation or another. This title shows us why he has many crowns because he is ruler over all the kingdoms. I need us to hear that today because we're worried about this worldly power and that worldly power because it affects us in our humanity. But we need to understand that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess right. that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Mm -hmm. He rules all the nations. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He rules them today. Yep. 
He's not going to rule them someday. Read the Bible. God gave him the earth as his footstool. Mm -hmm. He rules it today. And we, as believers, are seated in heavenly places yeah. with Christ Jesus. My goodness, if we could learn these truths on a day-in and day-out basis. That's the key, is the day-in and day-out. Day-in and day-out. That's why it's so imperative that we study and we read and we grow in the Word of God. He is ruler over all the kingdoms. This is a stark resemblance to Caesar. This, this is a historical fact that John brings out. It's a stark resemblance to Caesar who was referred to as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he was, if you study Caesar in the Roman Empire, he was king and he was Lord. And many called him King of Kings and Lord of Lords because nobody dared challenge Caesar in the Roman Empire. I mean, that was just, it didn't matter who you were, that was a death sentence. And so, he also rode a right horse to battle, Caesar did. Any movie you see depicting Caesar on anything other than a white horse is not true historically. He rode a white horse to battle. The riding on his thigh is most likely on the robe that covers that has been dipped in the blood. King of kings and lord of lords. Now I have known some people that have used this term written on his thigh to be literally his thigh and therefore justify tattoos. <laughs> I'm not opposed to tattoos. I don't want one. But this is not a passage to justify tattoos. <laughs> you want a tattoo, get one. I don't care. But please don't use this passage to justify it. I know how to stop it. How? Let me use the tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's far-fetched. It has nothing to do with this passage. If you want a tattoo, please get one. I don't care. Just don't use this verse as a, as a justification because it doesn't lean that way. In verse 15, John alludes to Psalm 2 and to Isaiah 63 2. In Psalm, it is a declaration of God setting up his king to overthrow the evil. Here describes the sword, the word of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Take up the sword, which is the word. He describes the sword, the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 says that that destroys the nations. And Isaiah 63, 2 describes one who treads in the winepress. Here in this passage, Jesus destroys his enemies with God's anger like one who treads grapes in the winepress. He will destroy them and rule over them with absolute authority. Now, we need to understand. We need to understand this very clearly. God is not an angry God. But God cannot tolerate, and uh, that's maybe not a good word, continue to allow sin in the end days. God doesn't destroy his enemy because he hates people and he's mad at them. God's anger is against what they do and what they stand for and the way they are. God wishes that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. This is not a vision of God being an angry God out to get people. This is an angry God getting rid of all that is opposed to him. Because in the kingdom there will be nothing opposed to him. And Jesus will rule with absolute authority over all. And you can't have rebellion and all that in that kind of authority. And so God, in his righteous indignation, destroys those that are opposed to him and his king. Only that. we got to get rid of this mentality that God is out to get us. God is not out to get anybody. Well, he may be. But he's not out to get you in a bad way. He's out to get you into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He's out to make you pure through the blood of Christ. Righteous through the blood of Christ. An overcoming victorious life through Christ. Not to punish you. God doesn't punish. Let me say that again. God doesn't punish. 
God convicts and draws so that we can make a decision for Christ or a decision against Christ. That's it. He fights his battle with a sword, which is the word of God. Which is the word of God. Proceeding from his mouth, or in other words, him declaring the word. It is amazing that God created everything with his word, and here he destroys with the same word. You need to let that sink in. There is power in words, life or death, blessing or cursing. Mm -hmm. That's how he created everything with his word. Mm -hmm. And here he destroys everything with the same word. Maybe not the same exact words, but what I mean by speaking. All right, the battle call, 17 and 18. Let me read it because i got to get done. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. I read through verse 19. We're going to discuss 17 and 18. There is no ordinary battle call. The call is for vultures, unclean animals to come for the great feast at the expense of all evil men. Kings, captains, and mighty men. And this call resembles a call that we read in Ezekiel 19. The same vultures are called to feast on the enemies of God in Israel. And after the destruction of God's people would be restored. This is in Ezekiel. After the evil man was destroyed and the vultures came and ate, God's people would be restored. His glory would be displayed upon them. And his Holy Spirit poured out upon them. That was a vision that Ezekiel had. What should be our attitude toward earthly governments since Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords? That's a good question. What should be our attitude toward earthly governments be? What should our attitude toward earthly governments be since Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords? I, I'm going to say it. I'll probably get in trouble for saying it. I don't care. Listen, I know whom I voted for. I do. But I don't care who's in the White House. Because Jesus is in control. Boom. Because he sets up kings and he tears down kings. Now, do I want a certain person in the White House over somebody else? We all do. Let's be honest. Right. Whether it's Democrat or Republican or Independent or Libertarian, we all have our choice. But when I allow my earthly choice to supersede my king, I'm out of order. We need to remember, no matter the government, that Jesus is still Lord and he's still king and the earth is not going to fade away because of some government official. Christ's word strikes down the nation. What should be our attitude toward this? In this passage, Christ's word strikes down the nations. How should it affect the lives of his followers? The word. In this passage, Christ's word strikes down the nations. How should the word affect the lives of his followers? I wrote down a few. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Uh, the word is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for teaching. It teaches us. It reproves, which means it gently rebukes us, brings us back in alignment, the Word does. For correction, it corrects us when we do something wrong. It corrects our false teaching. And there's a lot of that everywhere. 
Not just in the church, not just in the world, but everywhere. That's why it's imperative to study the word. You and I are not going to see eye to eye on everything in the word of God. We need to get over that petty stuff. As long as it's not the, the basis of the gospel, which is Christ and him crucified. For instruction in right living, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's what the word does, and that's the way we should respond. His word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. I love that passage. The good word of God directs my steps. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So the word of God brings wisdom. Boy, do we need that today. I know I do. Romans 15, 4. Through the encouragement of scriptures, we have hope. Anybody in here lost hope this year? Let me say it, Facebook Live. A lot of us have lost hope this year. In a lot of ways. But the word of God is our source of strength. Christ is our hope. He's our only hope. In any situation. Alright, I'm going to finish up these last three verses. How much time do I have? i got five minutes at most. Let me finish up. I didn't put notes on this, so follow me because the last three verses are powerful. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on his horse and against his army. So here we have the, um, the Antichrist, which is the beast, and we have all the kings that are following him that are the wicked kings and rulers of the world sitting there to make war with Christ and his army. And the beast was taken... And with him the false prophet. So the Antichrist and the false prophet are taken before the war ever begins. Let this sink in. Before the battle begins, the leaders of the enemy are taken. What happens when leaders take it out of the picture? I'm talking about, let's talk military. What happens when the leaders die? Confusion. What do we do now? Where's our leader? Right. Listen, they were taken and the false prophets were miracles before them and they had received, uh, he, he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So they were taken before the war and thrown into the fire. They were not part of this last battle. They were already gone. And the remnant were slain with the sword. What's the sword? The word. The word. How are you going to defeat the enemy? By the word. The word. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. The army didn't raise a weapon. <laughs> they sat and watched in victory. That's right. That's good. For those that could. Mm -hmm. Guess what? We can today. That's right. Amen. The enemy has already been defeated. He's not part of the picture. He is as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's a toothless lion. He is a worthy adversary, but he's a defeated foe in every battle I face. Amen. Whether I bring it on myself, whether he brings it against me, whether it's a test of God, it matters not where the battle comes from. It's already defeated if I'm a believer. I have to walk it out. Now, is that hard? Give me one second. Yes, it's hard. But it is possible because we have the sword which wins every battle. I think you put in, the, in this time that we are in and going farther in too, we've been put into a sifter. 
and it's making us look as we are going to look in this time that you're talking about here. And that is, we are going to stand alone. Each one of us is going to stand alone, responsible to the King of Kings. Yes. It's not going to be any help in numbers where we can go and blend into a church. <laughs> it's going to be a singular relationship. I've always said, that's a good point. It's a singular relationship. We're going to stand alone before Christ. Listen, I've always said, yes, we, have, we are part of a corporate body, but we have an individual relationship. Yep. Every person's relationship with Christ is individual first and corporate as an offspring of that. I love y'all. 